Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to repair an ADC equalizer. There seems to be a problem with one channel, only one channel seems to be working. So grab your favorite snack, sit back, and let's take a journey through the circuitry of this equalizer together. Let's bring it back to life. Here you are, sitting right at the bench with me, and this is the ADC stereo frequency equalizer that has an issue. It's called the Sound Shaper 2-IC, and it really is a nice looking equalizer. They did a nice job on the aesthetics here. I'll turn the unit on, and you can see that all the little adjustments all light up. That looks really nice. And this here is a level meter that is supposed to work with the music. So that should probably be a good indication of what channel is going to be working and what channel isn't. Supposedly just a channel is not working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some test equipment set up here and I'm going to feed a signal into this thing and we'll determine which channel isn't working. The first thing I'm going to do is verify that this equalizer is not working because much of the time devices get a thing called repairman syndrome. What is repairman syndrome you ask? Well, the owner of the device swears that the thing doesn't work. You put it on your bench, turn it on, and everything works just fine. And you're scratching your head, and he's scratching his head. So he takes the thing back home, and it doesn't work again. So then he gets frustrated, and he brings the thing back. And then usually the second time, it doesn't work. And this is an actual thing. It's very strange. And all the technicians and repairmen that are watching this out there will totally resonate with that. So we want to make sure that the thing is actually not working first. And in order for me to do that, I need to feed a very low distortion signal source into this thing to do some testing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the curve and signature tracer over here because this has a very low distortion sine wave output available at this jack right here. So this is one of the projects that has been built and put together up on Patreon. This is a $5 oscilloscope with some modifications done inside. So the first thing I want to do is protect this thing. And we've also built a thing called a DC block. And this thing here just blocks any DC from going back into this and damaging it. So this protects this when you're using this on vacuum tube equipment or anything with high voltage. This thing also has got a slight modification to it now. So there is an addendum that will be in the next video on Patreon for all of you that have built this DC block. There's a component added. And what that does is it actually lowers the distortion even more at this point right here. And when you plug this thing in, it keeps the curve tracer slash signature tracer out of sleep mode. So when you plug this thing in, it will stay awake and it will display a circle on the screen to let you know that you're using this thing as a signal source. As you advance the gain, the circle will get bigger and smaller, just like that. So what I'm going to do now is plug this into this here. So basically what this is going to do is put some signal right here at these RCA jacks that you see here. And I'm going to plug this into the back side of this equalizer here. So I'll get this around here. And it says input right here, as you can see. So what I'm going to do is just plug these in. It doesn't matter. It can be plugged in any old way because they're just bridged together at this Y right here. And I'll just turn this back around again, like so. Make sure that the gain is down and I will turn this on. I'll turn the gain up. Is this meter out? Maybe we need this in. There we go. All right, so we got left output here, which is at half. So I'll just turn that right to its max. And the meter for right is at its max, and the meter for left is at its max. So I'll turn the right output right up to its maximum. And as you can see, it's the right channel. So no repairman syndrome today. So we can see here that, yeah, there is signal on the left channel, but not on the right. 
so turn this down just a little bit so there it is all right so what we need to do now is remove the lid so what I'll do is I'll save you from the tedium of me taking screws out and things like that and I'll move the camera around here I'll remove the lid and we'll take a look inside and I'll try to find a schematic for this thing as well and that'll help us along in our troubleshooting procedure no big deal if we can't find a schematic because we can just use this thing and it'll bring us right to the component really fast I managed to find a nice clean schematic for this equalizer they did a nice job in the design looks nice and sound they did a nice job drawing it up nice clean looking schematic but they forgot something so incredibly basic so we can see here we have two channels right very easy to spot the different channels because basically you just look for similarities on each side right so we can see that we have one channel here and another channel right here and then we would also know that you know this is the equalizer with all the sliders for one channel and this for the other channel now looking at this we know on the preamplifier from what we've tested so far is that the right channel doesn't seem to be working we're going to perform one more test just to make absolutely sure that that channel is not working so I'll explain that here in just a moment stranger things have happened here and I'll, I'll explain a scenario that I've run across before as well kind of like repairman syndrome right so looking at both of these channels and we know that the right channel is faulty right what channel is the right channel on the schematic nowhere on the schematic have they marked left or right there's differences in the part numbers between each channel so you know they've they've definitely done that we know on the equalizer itself that we clearly have a left and a right channel they haven't marked channel one and channel two so all the controls are you know l and r left and right and on the meters left and right and on the back the inputs and the outputs are left and right but on the schematic there's no markings anywhere to which channel is left or right so say we definitely knew that the right channel is toast say this was the right channel we would know immediately to start testing at this point we could locate tr102 and start testing at that point and just move our way along now this is easy enough to find out in the actual equalizer itself by just some basic tests but why not just put an l and an r or vice versa depending on which way the channels are in here and just simplify things again what's happened with the schematic is it's gone through too many hands and what ended up happening is the design team knew the part numbers and everything but when it ended up at the end of the line they're like well we know all the part numbers but what channel is actually left and which one is right well let's just leave it out that's usually what ends up happening right such an odd thing so at any rate we'll mark the l and the r or vice versa in here we find that out so any of you that are working on one of these things you just make things a little bit easier on you so it's very easy to spot two channels in this we can see we have similarities here and we have similarities here so we know that this is going to be one channel this is going to be the other we can see that we have the inputs and outputs here the inputs and outputs here and we have a cluster of switches in here and here so we have two separate channels right here and right here so we have an input right here so the input signal from the the curve tracer that we're using the low distortion signal source is going to go through here through this switching network and it should end up at the base of this transistor right here so the signal path will be like this through here down through here through this op amp we'll have signal here the signal will end up right here at the base of this transistor and then what they've done between this stage and this stage here is they've put the equalizer with all the sliders right between here and right here you can see we have a, a row of op amps here and you can see that we have some leads running from the top here all the way down in through here and it does get kind of confusing when they put them all together like this so a trick is to follow this very carefully you can use a ruler or whatever if you very carefully follow the lines and then just put a color dot up here a color dot for red and as you can see a little color dot for red here and then if we want to follow this one back we can see the green dot goes from here to here so we know that they've placed this between these two stages right here 
And it's the same for this channel here. See, I've marked a yellow dot here and a blue dot here. Yellow dot here and blue dot here. Now, a lot of people, they like to draw an entire red line and an entire green line. That makes for a very messy schematic. So just putting some dots is an easier and cleaner way of finding out where things go. Just uh, a little hint, a little trick if you're working on a condensed schematic. Now on the camera, this schematic looks pretty big, right? But you can see, compared to my fingernail here, how small this symbol is for the transistor. So this is actually a very small schematic to work with. And I've magnified a certain area on the schematic, and I'll explain that here in just a little bit. And that'll be the area that we're going to start troubleshooting first. So we know that we have a signal path so far, like this, here, here. And then we have our equalizer here. We're going to have signal here. And then our signal path is going to go here, and it's going to end up here, and it's going to go back out. So this is going to be our output here, and it's going to end up at the output through the switches here again at the out. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about this and the way that they've designed this, you can see that we have a red dot here, red dot here, green dot here, green dot here. So basically, if any of this section fails, we're still going to have signal at this point right here. We have a whole bunch of VRs across this thing here. So unless there's a wire disconnected at this point or up here, there's really that nothing that's going to really affect the signal like the, to the point to where it's completely gone like what we see. So what we're looking for is a signal that looks to be completely missing on one channel. So unless a wire is broken or there's traces broken up here or here, we can pretty comfortably say that this is probably going to be okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow the signal at through this point through this point here to here, and then we're going to follow the signal through. There's a little FET right here. We're going to follow the signal right to the output on each one here, and we'll find out where the signal is missing, either on this channel or this channel. Again, I don't know which one is right or left at this point, right? So we'll discover that when we're testing. Now, here's the thing. In stranger things have happened. You know, I talk about repairman syndrome, right? So we know that we fed a signal into this thing and it appears like the right channel isn't working. So for argument's sake, we'll just say that this is the right channel. I don't know this at this point, but we'll say this is the right channel, okay? So this channel here isn't working. There's supposedly something wrong in this channel. Now, stranger things have happened. You can see I fed a signal into both channels and we saw that one meter was working and the other meter wasn't. So there is a chance that the metering circuit isn't working and maybe the owner of this EQ has got a bad patch cable. So we want to make doubly, triply sure that we actually have no signal. So before we actually start troubleshooting this whole thing, I'm going to feed the signal into both inputs again through that connector like you saw. And I'm going to put an oscilloscope on each output and we're going to make sure that there's definitely no signal on one of the outputs or, you know, very little signal at least. Again, you know, we want to make absolute sure that we're, you know, hunting down a missing signal and, you know, maybe not a bad meter circuit or something like that. So as I'm going through all that, I'll explain all of that. So that's what we're going to do next. Now, what I've done is this is the section that we're going to focus on here, right? Because, you know, the chances of this being faulty or something wrong other than a wire missing is, you know, pretty much we can ignore this, right? So I've taken this and I've made it a lot larger just so it's easier for me to work with and easier for you to see. And I'll flash this in front of the camera as I'm testing things as we're going along. And I'll show you exactly what I'm doing as I'm going along here. So what we'll do is, again, we'll put an input onto each one of these channels here. And we want to look at the, I believe it was the right channel again, that had no output. So we'll scope the right channel and make sure that that is missing first. As you can see, again, nice and big, and we'll just follow the signal through and find out where it goes missing. Where the signal goes missing is where we need to search a little deeper and find the problem, wherever that may be, whether it's in the switches or, you know, transistors, op amps, wherever, right? I have all the screws removed from the lid, so let's take a look inside. Look at how nice and easy that comes off, that's so nice. Common with basically all metal construction. You can see that the face is nice and rigid and the chassis is very solid, complete chassis on this thing. 
a lot of modern gear has a plastic face and they have these little tabs that clip onto the lid or the lid will clip into those tabs and what that does is that holds the plastic face tight to the lid so it keeps that seam nice and tight so it looks really nice. Whenever you remove a lid, it's almost like a step process on a piece of equipment like that. That's the first thing I look for for signs of tampering is if any of those tabs are broken. Because unless you know how to actually take that lid off, it's very easy to break those plastic tabs that hold the face tight to the lid. And then of course you get that kind of sloppy seam after that because nothing is held tight anymore. So something to keep in mind if you ever remove the lid from a modern piece of gear, look for those broken tabs. If they're broken, you know somebody's been in there at some particular time fooling around. So as you can see, this is all metal construction. There's no need for those tabs or anything like that because this is just going to fit tight to the lid. When I removed all the screws from the case, all the screws were nice and centered and the little holes in the lid. So they did a really nice job putting this thing together. Everything was measured correctly. That's always a, a good sign of design. In a moment here, what we're going to do is zoom on in and take a look at the circuitry here and familiarize ourselves with the circuitry before we start troubleshooting. And that way we can go right to the area and troubleshoot the correct area without, you know, basically having to hunt around first. It's always the first thing that you want to do is familiarize yourself, find the area you want to troubleshoot in, you know, compare it to the schematic, the part numbers to the area, and that way you'll get an idea of a path and what path to follow. A little trick to make things just a little bit faster. Now, if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Opening a case on a piece of equipment like this exposes AC, and the older the piece of equipment, they seem to be a little bit more, I guess you could call it lax with keeping the AC components and you know AC parts shielded. As you can see in the back here, we have an auxiliary outlet in the back and there's exposed AC lines right here. So if I was to come across that, if this was plugged in, you know, I'd get a pretty bad shock and it could be lethal as well. So if you're not familiar with working on a piece of equipment like this, I strongly suggest you familiarize yourself with the technology of the era and the technology that you're working on before you go inside because you could receive a really, really bad shock if you work on the wrong area or come across something in the wrong area. Most modern equipment, they shield, they put heat shrink tubing or something over all the AC connections. It's something that they do nowadays. There still are exceptions though, but the older the equipment is and the further you go back, it's almost like they just expect you to know back then. And you know, you would just know that you know, there's exposed AC there. So again, if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Please be careful and take care. Just before we get started in the troubleshooting procedure, let's make absolute sure that the right channel is not working. So if we look on the back side of the chassis here, we can see that we have our input right here, left and right, and then we have our output, which will also be left and right. This whole row is left and this whole row is right. So we can get to the outputs on the inside of the chassis with an oscilloscope, and what I'll do right now is I'll just plug my signal generator while I have the chassis up like this like this. Now it doesn't matter which way the RCAs go in because it just comes to a Y right here and we're feeding the same signal into both channels. So, this down here again. Now in the back, the wires are exposed to the outputs here. So on the bottom we have a pink wire and it looks to be a beige wire on the top. So I'll just move this into here and I'll try and zoom on in just a little bit. So you can see, there's a pink wire here, and they've used the wire wrapping technique. That's what this is called right here, wire wrapping. So there's a lot of area for me to clip my oscilloscope probe onto either channel, and then there's the ground. If I move this out of the way, there's a ground right here. So that's what I'll do right now, is I'll just probe at that point. That'll make my life a lot easier than trying to fit an RCA connection onto my oscilloscope. So, just back that out like so that should allow me to get an oscilloscope back there grab my little scope here my miniature CRT oscilloscope I really like this little scope gets lots of attention if you take this thing out in the public it's like a, a baby oscilloscope it's really cute so now what I'm gonna do is first of all I'll turn on my isolated variac supply here so I'll turn that on right now, and the switch is on, so I'm doing good. 
Now I'll give it some amplitude again. So I'm going to turn up the signal generator, which is the curve tracer here. So I'll just turn that up. Okay. So as you can see, I'll just move this out of the way for one sec here. You can see that we only have one channel that's actually doing anything right here, right? This one here isn't doing anything, so it does look like the right channel is not working. So, let's check that out. So, I will attach my scope up here. Try and do this all in the shot. Turn this on. And I'll adjust the focus to the scope. There we go. And I'll clip this on to here. So this is onto the ground or common. So we'll take a look up here. And look at that, we have signal on this channel, no problems there. So that's the left channel on the top. And let's go down to the bottom channel, which is the right channel. And it is definitely toast. So there is no signal there. I'll just move the focus onto the probe lead here so you can take a better look at that. So you can see it's down here on the bottom connection. So no signal there whatsoever. Go back to the scope here again. And I'll move this back up to the top. So no problems there. So I'll turn the amplitude up on the signal generator here, which is the curve tracer. And you can see no problems there. Beautiful looking sine wave. So we definitely have a channel that is toast. So what I'm going to do now is get all this stuff out of the way here and we'll start comparing the schematic to the area that we need to start troubleshooting in and we'll find the problem and fix it. The first thing that we want to do to start the troubleshooting procedure on this equalizer is find how the signal is getting from the input jacks on the back side of the unit onto the circuit board and where on the circuit board that signal is going first. In order to do that, we'll take a look at the schematic here in just a moment. Before I get started, this unit here has been unplugged from my isolation transformer and variac supply, so there is no AC supply attached to this right now. And all the capacitors here have been safely discharged with that discharger box that's been built and released on Patreon here. By doing that, it makes it safe for me to poke around in here, I can zoom on in and bend components around, and I don't have to worry about damaging the unit, or damaging myself for that matter, as well. So the first thing that we want to do is find how the signal is getting from the input jack into the base of the first transistor here. So we know that the signal goes from the input jack through a bunch of switching and then into this point right here and it does that for both channels. We still don't know which channel is left or right but we'll locate that here in just a little bit. So we want to look for TR101 and TR102. Once we've located that, we know that that's where the signal enters all of this circuitry. When we start troubleshooting, if we have no signal, say we have no signal at this point right here, we would know that the problem is this way. If we have signal at this point here, and this is the faulty channel, we would know that the problem is this way. Right? So if we have signal here, obviously it's making its way through the circuitry to this point. So we know that all of this is going to be okay to this point, and then we have to troubleshoot this way. So that's how it starts, and it's the same with this channel as well. So we have a signal present here. If we find a signal at this point here, we know that pretty much all of this is going to be okay, and we have to start looking this way. So the first thing that we want to identify on the circuit board is TR101 and TR102. So for those of you that are new to troubleshooting and new to looking at schematics, this is not the part number of the transistor. This simply stands for transistor 101 and transistor 102. This is their legend to help us find these parts on their design, on their circuit board. The actual component part numbers are underneath here. The 2SC part numbers are the actual part numbers for this component. So whenever you're looking in a piece of equipment and you see you know, TR1 or TR2 or you know, TR150, TR151, that just means transistor 151 and so on. 
a lot of the times on the schematic itself, they do not mark the part numbers. They did a nice job with the schematic and they were pretty thorough, including voltages and everything. So nicely done schematic. Again, you know, no left and right, but you know, I guess uh, that's just to be tolerated at this point. So we're going to look for TR-101 and TR-102 first on this board. So what I'm going to do is zoom on in to the circuit board here just a little bit. And we'll move to, you see, TR-204 right here and TR-203 right here. So we'll start over here. And we can see right away, almost immediately, TR-101 and TR-102. So we know that the signal is entering these two transistors right here. So this would be the place that we're going to look for the signal first. Now, we know that by looking at this, we can see TR-101 and TR-102. We know that they're on separate channels. So we have TR-102 right here and TR-101. So chances are the dividing line between the channels is probably right in the middle right here, right? So from that point, it goes from TR-101 into this op amp right here. And it says IC-101, one half. That means that this is half of a device. So there are two op amps, so technically two triangles, in one device. So this is IC-101 and this is only one half of that device. And this is the part number down here. So we need to locate IC-101 and that'll tell us where the signal is going from this point right here. So, we see IC-102 back here, but if we look right up here, you can see hiding under all these cables is IC-101 down there. So the signal is going to go from here over to IC-101. Again, there's two parts. There's two op amps inside this one package, inside this one 8-pin package right here. So it goes from here over to here, and then from IC-101... It goes into TR-103, so we'll follow this channel here first. It goes into TR-103 and then into IC-102. So, we already can see TR-103 right here, and we know that this is IC-102 because we just spotted that earlier. So, it goes from here into the op amp up here, through here, into here, and we can kind of see the progression as it's going back. You can almost guess the way it's going right here here and here so this is one channel and this is the other channel and i can see d so this is tr110 tr109 so if we're looking at the same channel again here we go tr109 bingo so there's that little fat and we can see the d for drain right so there's a fat right here and we even have a little fat symbol on the board here they were kind of nice and put that in tr109 and then from there I'm guessing it's going to go into TR-105 and TR-107, right here and right here. So I'm going to move some of these wires out of the way a little bit. You can see TR-107 and TR-105. What a surprise. TR-105 and TR-107. And the signal goes from there back to the output jack on the back here again through some switching. So we know that we have one channel that's going like this back here so that is the dividing line between the two channels and then this will be the other channel very easy to identify again try and get most of this into the shot here so we can see tr102 and then we have ic101 one half which we know is up here right so we have tr102 here and then i move this capacitor out of the way it says tr104 and then it should go into IC-102 again. TR-104, IC-102. We see TR-110, which should be this little FET right here. TR-110. And then we see TR, looks to be 10, what is that, 106? Looks a little bit smeared down there. And then TR-108. There it is. TR-106, TR-108. And there it is. 
So this is where we're going to start troubleshooting. So we'll start at this point here. So in order for me to start the troubleshooting procedure, I'll get some test equipment set up here. We'll feed a signal into this and we'll start looking for a signal through here. And I'll show you that process. I've been asked many, many times to use the Carlson Super Probe in a troubleshooting video. And one of the main reasons that I shy away from using this is because it just makes the troubleshooting procedure too easy. It's over just that fast. Now, in a production setting, if you're using this thing to find you know, faulty components and you know find where the signal's missing in stages and things like that, this thing is absolutely wonderful. This thing is great for that. But when you're making videos, it just it gets you through the, the troubleshooting procedure in the blink of an eye. It really is just too easy. And it, it's actually kind of ridiculous. You'll see what I mean here in just a moment. So you'll, you'll really see it's good PR for the, you know, the Carlson Super Pro, but it, it makes for very, very fast troubleshooting procedures. Again, that's one of the reasons I shy away from using this thing. If you'd like to see this thing used more in different types of troubleshooting procedures, just let me know in the comments below. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll consider that for future use. It's, it's a, a whole lot easier than using an oscilloscope or a DMM or anything like that for troubleshooting. So this is known as a non-contact style form of probing for those of you that are, are new to this channel and new to this. So that means that basically I just clip this common lead here to a ground. So I'll clip it to the common ground here in here. And what I do is I just move this thing close to the stage and it'll tell me if the stages are moving without even touching any components. As you can see, it's fully insulated on the end here. So there is no touching leads like you would do with an oscilloscope or a DMM. So, you know, there's no risk of further damaging any components. You just, you know, breeze through the circuit super, super fast and you find the problem. So I'll demonstrate that here in just a moment. You'll see how ridiculously fast this goes with this with the super probe. So what I'll do is I'll turn on the super probe here. I have a signal going on to this right now or into the back side here. And this is plugged into my isolation transformer and variac supply. I also have my signal generator off to the side here, which is that the, uh, the signature tracer and that's feeding a signal into the back here. So we're all set to go. So I'll turn on the super probe and give it just a little bit of volume. You can see how incredibly sensitive it is. So lots of noise. So there's a, a one kilohertz or very close to tone going into this right now, coming into these leads. And you can hear it just by bringing this thing close into the circuit. You know, it's, I'm at chassis level right now, right at the top side. You can hear how incredibly sensitive that is, right? So what I'll do is I'll go close to a transistor in one stage. We'll go this stage first. So I'll go close to this transistor here first and see if we have signal there. You can check out the green LED. So you can see that, how brightly that glows. So that's the first transistor. So now we know that the signal goes from here into that first IC and then from there into this transistor here. So instead of me probing down in here, let's just get close to this transistor right here and see if it's making it through. It's just an easier path. So if it was mute here, we would know that the problem's back in here somewhere. So let's find out. So we know that the signal's definitely getting to this little transistor here. What I'll do is I'll zoom on in just a little bit. It might make things a little bit easier. So you can see that. And then I'll back away. You'll see the little green LED go out. It's kind of hard to see because there's a lot of light here. There's this light here that's shining on it. Yeah, let's move that out of the way a little bit. Okay, so we know that the signal is getting here, so it goes into this IC, and then it goes from this IC over to the FET here. So go to close to the IC, lots of signal there. So I'll get close to the FET, lots of signal there. And then what we'll do is we'll go right between these two output transistors and we'll see if there's a signal there. I'll get this on the other side of this 
the ground lead here. Lots of signal at the output. Okay, so we know that we have signal all the way through to the output on this channel, so let's try the other channel now. Okay, so we'll get close to this transistor here. So we have signal there. So we know that the signal is getting through all the switching to both of these transistors right here, so that right there eliminates a lot of issues. So right there, we know that the signal is getting to both of these transistors, so we know whatever channel it is. We've tested one channel already, so we've tested TR101. So we've tested this channel here, and there's signal right to here, because we put the, the probe right between that point right there, right? We have tons of signal, as you can see right there, right? So now we're going to probe this channel, so we'll move our way along. Again, we'll skip this IC right here because it's kind of down in here, and we'll go right to here. So if there was no signal here on that channel, we would know that the problem is back here, and we'd have to look at that IC. So we'll just skip that one area, and we'll go right over to this transistor here. No problems. Okay, so we'll move up to the FET here. No problems there. Okay. And now we'll go between the two output transistors on the back side here. Wow. So we definitely have an issue here. Okay, so between these two. And between these two. So we have no signal at this point right here, and that is between these two transistors. So already we've identified that there's a problem right in this area. That's how fast. See what I mean? It's kind of ridiculous. So what I'll do now is, since we know that it's in this area right here, so it seems to be right here, so what I'll do is I'll put the probe close to C124, and that's the output of the IC, and then we'll check the validity of this FET here, and then we'll go close to C, looks like 128, looks like C128, I'll just zoom on in here, it's easier for me to see, there it is, okay, so there's C124 right here, and C128 right here, so we want to see if there's signal here, Lots of signal there. Let's go to C128. It's quiet. So the only thing... Now if we go between the output transistors, it's quiet here again, right? Because there's no signal getting here. So C128. C124. The only thing that's between C124 and C128 really is this FET right here. So there's obviously signal getting into the FET. But there's no signal getting out of it, it looks like. So whether that's a problem in the surrounding circuitry or voltage or whether the FET is open, we still need to verify that. So... Yeah, definitely a problem. Let me turn the volume down a little bit here. LED is a nice little feature too, it really helps verify. And then again, if we go to the opposite channel... ...to this channel... So right now, this is really looking suspect, this little FET right here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use the signature tracer and we're going to compare what this FET looks like to this FET because the two channels are identical and we'll see if we see any differences here. There's a few things that you want to look for in a FET like this and when I have the curve tracer all set up and you know that in the screenshot here I'll explain exactly what we're going to look for. The next step is to verify 
both of these FETs right here. So we want to make sure that they're both working. We know this one works. So if we didn't know what a FET looked like in circuit, we could simply compare the results of this one to this one here. But I'll explain what you can expect when you test a JFET in circuit. So this is an N-channel JFET, a 2SK30. So this is a depletion type device. And now when I say depletion, simply all that means is it takes a negative voltage on the gate to turn this thing off. So if you remember Remember that it'll help you remember depletion so since there is no negative voltage right now this chassis is completely unplugged so there's no AC on it everything is discharged whenever you're using a curve tracer or a signature tracer you want to make sure everything is discharged and there's no voltage anywhere because you don't want to damage your curve tracer right so the curve tracer itself supplies everything needed to test these devices in circuit so since this is a depletion type device there is no negative voltage to turn that little transistor this little JFET off so that means that it's going to be in a resistive region so if it's in a resistive region what type of symbol will we have on the curve tracer or the signature tracer we're going to have what looks like a diagonal line indicating resistance and that will be from the source to the drain so we'll take a look at the curve tracer now and I'll grab the two test leads here so it doesn't matter which way the test leads go in circuit, absolutely fine to hook it up this way or this way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the black lead here on the source, just because it's in this hand. And I'm going to go to the drain with this lead right here. And we'll take a look at the curve tracer. And there we have our diagonal line. So right now it's in a resistive region. Now, another test that we can perform on this FET to make sure that it's okay in circuit is we can take either lead and attach that. And I'll take this lead here, which is the red lead, and I'll poke it to the drain, and we should get what looks like a diode symbol on the curve tracer. So here we go. There's that diode symbol. Now, if I go to the other lead, so right now I'm going from the gate to the drain. If I go from the gate to the source, we'll see another diode symbol. There it is. So we can be pretty sure that this FET is okay. If we were to take this FET out of circuit and test it out of circuit, we would get a pattern on the desk that looks like an oscillating X. And I'll explain that a little bit here. And uh, once I get this whole thing all apart, I'll pull both of the FETs out and I'll demonstrate what the oscillating X is. It's a test that's never failed me with testing any J FET on the bench and uh, probably find it quite interesting here. So I'll show you that in just a little bit and just another trick of using this device and testing these small components. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go on this device here. This is the device in question. I'm gonna go from the source to the drain on this again. And again, this is a depletion type device. So we should get that diagonal line. It should be somewhere in a resistive state right now. So here we go, source to drain. And look at that, we have nothing on the screen. So what does that tell us already? So if I move this to the gate, we should have what looks like a diode. There it is. Now, if I move this lead here to this other side, we should have that diode symbol again. And there's nothing there. So right at this point, I'm pretty positive that this device is the fault in this channel and this will need to be replaced. So this is a little bend that over there as you can see k30 so whenever you see k and a number on it like k30a you have to remember to put 2s in front of it and that's how you look these things up so 2sk30a would be the part number of this and then there's a gr after it now a 2n5486 will very comfortably replace this in circuit and i'll explain why here in just a little bit really just too much time working in chassis like this brings you to this these answers very very fast the 2 and 5 4 8 6 is another n-channel j fet that will work absolutely fine in here so what i'll do is i'll desolder this device here then i'll desolder this device here and i'll show you what the oscillating x is and if you test a j fet on the bench with a curve tracer or signature tracer and you get the oscillating x symbol you can pretty much be sure that that fet is absolutely fine we'll take a look at that here in just a bit as well first of all i'll get these things out of the circuit board 
I'm ready to remove both of the FETs. What I've done is I've put a little mark right at the center lead of each FET on the board. This very easily comes off with alcohol or lacquer thinner, whatever you're using to clean the flux off the board. When I install the new devices, I clean the whole area, make it really look like nobody's ever been in here before. So all of this will just come off. So these are the two FETs that I'm going to remove. And what I'll do is I'll just zoom on in here a little bit, get you a little bit closer to what's going on. So these are the three leads that I need to desolder. And these are the three leads that I need to desolder. So I'll just grab the tool here and on top. There we go. I'll go over to this one here. So those should be just about ready to come out of the board now. So I'll turn this around like so. I'll grab this one here. No problems. Get that out of the way. And this one here. No problems. Out of the board just like that. And I'm not even worried about confusing them because we're going to test them both here in just a moment. Let's test both of these FETs now that they're out of circuit, and I'll demonstrate what the oscillating X is. So let's take a look at the curve tracer here. So I'll go across this one here first and see what we get. See if we get anything. I'm probably going to poke some holes in this paper. Nothing with this one here, so that's probably the bad one. Let's go to this one here, and there it is. That is the oscillating X. And this is what you'll see when you use this to test JFETs on the bench. So you can see it looks like an X pattern and you can clearly see the oscillations. That's because the gate lead is floating. So we know that this one here is the good one. So I'll move this one out of the way and we can definitely see here that this one is the bad one as we just tested and nothing happened. So there we go. Nothing. So that one I will put over here so I don't get it confused. So this is a 2N5486. This is what I'm going to use to replace this FET that's good here. So, well, this one here will go back into circuit and I'll use the 2N5486 as a replacement. Chances are what I'm going to do is end up matching two of these devices here and put two 2N5486s in and I'll just remove this all together. Just so I have two very closely matched devices to keep the channels as close as possible. So, get this one out of the way here. I'll put this one back in circuit so we can compare the results. So I'll put this one in and this one here. And it's probably going to be very close. So, we'll take a look at this one. So now the pinout of a 2N5486 is a little bit different. This is drain, source, and gate. Where this transistor, the good one here is source gate drain. So what we have to do is move a couple of leads around. So basically what you do is you just move the transistor on an angle and then adjust the leads and put them in the holes and it should be absolutely fine. That's the difference between, you know, dealing with a 2SK product and a 2N product. So they, you know, they've got to be difficult and put the leads in different places. So anyways, let's test this one. We'll go from source to drain on this one and we'll see the oscillating X on the curve tracer again. So we'll take a look at the curve tracer again here. And there it is. There's the oscillating X. And that again is because the gate lead is open. So if I move this over here, and what I'll do is I'll probe this here and I'll just touch the gate lead with my finger and it'll slow the oscillation and you'll actually see the X straighten up a little bit here. So I'll put this here like so, and you can see as I touch the gate lead with my finger, you can see how the X kind of straightens up. Now I'll remove my finger from the gate lead. Right, here, I'll just move this here like so. And you can see, oh, it's popping out of, I'll just reverse the leads, leave it down like so. There you go, there's the oscillating X again. Again, I'll touch the gate lead. There you go. And I'll remove my finger. You can see the oscillation picks up. 
So very, very simple test to test these JFETs and it's never led me astray once. So if you see that pattern on your signature or curve tracer when you go from drain to source, pretty much rest assured that your FET is okay. And then again, if you want, you can even touch the gate lead and you can see the results. Of course, I'm slipping off the leads here. There you go. And then that's with my finger removed. And again, we should get the diode if we go from the gate to the other leads. So what I'll do is I'll go from here to here. You can see that diode looking symbol. And I'll move from here to here. You can see the diode looking symbol again. So very simple test for JFETs on the bench using the signature or curve tracer. Again, if you get the oscillating X symbol when you're testing any type of a small signal JFET, you're pretty much good to go. It's never led me astray, put it that way. You might be wondering why I think a 2N5486 will comfortably replace a 2SK30A even though the 2N5486 has a drain gate voltage of only 25 volts, whereas the stock device is a 50 volt rated device. Well, in this circuit, this is just acting as a switch. In fact, this is acting as a pop switch. All this thing is doing is it's shutting the audio off to stop this from creating a pop in the speakers when you first turn this thing on. So really, it's just dealing with audio level signals and they're very, very low. We can even see the capacitors on each side are only rated at 16 volts, one here and one here. So the 2N5486 will very, very comfortably replace the 2SK30A and it will in many applications. Again, the things that you need to look for are, you know, the drain gate voltage and things like that, Re reverse gate source voltage, things like that. In this case, again, it's absolutely fine. You can see here the gate voltage is rated at 0.5 of a volt. You know, right here it says zero volts and zero volts. Well, you know, this when we add audio to this, of course, we're gonna have an audio signal on each side, but it'll fall well within the ratings of the component. No problems whatsoever. The 2N5486 is a great device, you know, really low capacitance device. It's designed for, you know, VHF and UHF amplifiers. It has really good noise figures as well. So I'm quite comfortable replacing both of these parts here with the 2N5486. I have the new transistor installed right here. And as you can see, it's facing that way. And that's because I've moved the leads like this. So this way, none of the leads touch and it fits into the circuit just fine. So we need to move a few of the leads around in order to make this fit. So this just now would fit into the board like that. And there would be no leads touching. If we tried to keep it this way and, you know, move the, the leads around, leads would end up touching, or I'd need to put lead dress on this so that they, you know, they don't touch together when I twist things around. So it's just easier to mount the transistor that way. And there's lots of clearance. And that's what's been done on this side right here. What I'm going to end up doing is installing another one of these on this side. So I've matched a pair of 2N5486s on a different type of curve tracer. It's a step type curve tracer. And I have videos on matching transistors and things like that with a curve tracer. So that's a little bit beyond this video right here, but there are two matched devices that are gonna end up going in here. So we'll just compare this one here with the original one, which is right here, the 2SK30, which is down in that spot right there again. I have the curve tracer acting as a signal generator again. So I'm feeding the signal at the output jacks on the signature and curve tracer into the input on the back side of the equalizer here. I have also set the equalizer flat here. So that should give us a good idea of what's going on. So what I'll do is I'll advance the gain and we'll take a look at the meter here. So here we go. Look at that. No problems really close to on each side. So again, the 2N5486 and the 2SK30 are only really acting as switches. So not too incredibly important to have them in, you know, incredibly closely matched, but I have two very closely matched FETs and I'll change that 2SK30 out on the other channel just to have two identical components in the signal path on each side. So it's working good. 
turn this back up again and turn that back down. So what I'll do is I'll attach an oscilloscope to the backside and we'll take a look at the signal on each channel as well. I have my very small oscilloscope attached to both the left and the right output of this equalizer. So one trace represents right and the other trace represents left. What I'll do is I'll turn up my curve tracer, which is acting as a signal generator here. So I'll turn up the gain and we'll take a look at both channels. Here we go. Look at that, it looks great. No problems whatsoever. So another neat piece of stereo gear lives on again. Repair successful. If you think building and using pieces of test equipment like this will make you a better troubleshooter or a better electronics technician, you're definitely going to want to check out my Patreon page. All the files for these devices have been released up there. All the printed circuit board layouts, all the component maps, schematics, and instructional videos on how to use these things and build these things are all up there. And it's a continual thing. I keep adding new pieces of test gear that I've modified or designed up there and I'm sharing it with the community. So there's a lot of really neat projects up there beyond what you see here on the bench. So this video was just a quick example of how incredibly useful the Super Probe and the Curve Tracer are just as two devices. And there are so many more pieces of test gear up there, custom pieces of test gear that I've designed and I'm sharing with everyone. I hope you enjoyed the repair journey through this ADC stereo equalizer. If you did enjoy this video, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos coming like this in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state equipment alike. So there'll be a lot of repairs, restoration, troubleshooting, and even circuitry design right here. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level, and if you're interested in learning my thought process as I repair and restore equipment, you might want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below this video at the top of the comments section, so if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. Alright, until next time, take care. Bye for now.